it is my great pleasure to welcome, albeit virtually, um, Professor Edward Holmes, um, I think joining us from South Africa, if I understood correctly. Um, Correct. So he did his training in the UK, uh, including a PhD in Cambridge, which, if Wikipedia is correct, was on molecular evolution in primates. But then throughout his career, his work, especially since 2012 at the University of Sydney, has been our, um, around the emergence of pathogens, including but not exclusively viruses. And um, one thing that um, this Holmes lab has done is being one of the very first labs really leveraging metagenomics to look at the global diversity of viruses and in his case, mostly RNA viruses in animals, vertebrates and invertebrates. But still, you know, his work has been one of the, you know, most advanced one and most early one, really leveraging omics technology for this purpose. Um, you know, Eddie has received uh, a number of international awards that I don't have the time to list here. But suffice to say that his work as intersection of metagenomics, evolution, and epidemiological epidemiology has been really key and foundational to the field. And with that, I'm looking forward to this talk, which was, um, you know, quickly titled and, and shortly titled Redefining Virus Microevolution, which sounds great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I assume you can all see that. Look, yeah, I'm sorry I'm not there. Originally, I was meant to be there. Then I was told by my university um, that I had, I had to go to a meeting in South Africa and there's no way I could get out of it. So I'm actually speaking to you from a guest house in Stellenbosch, South Africa, and it's about 8.15 in the evening here. So uh, I am sorry. But background, that's the University of Sydney. That's not where I am at the moment. So I'd rather grandly um, gave a title about rather pompous title actually about trying to use, show how you can use metagenomics to redefine macro virus macro evolution i'm going to start by that but i'm also going to discuss something else because every day of my life is for the last three and a half years has been dominated by by um covid19 origins which is an ongoing saga stroke nightmare for me and i i feel i need to kind of get a few things off my chest and discuss this and it does actually relate to kind of the bigger picture so i'm going to discuss that in the second half of my talk so the first half will be as advertised about virus macro evolution and the second half will be possibly controversial stuff on covid origins so i hope you kind of enjoy the ride um in fact you actually you are even though i'm, I'm actually remote this time i am speaking to you which is actually one step up from the last meeting i was asked to take place part in the in the us which was on july the 11th this year and the uh, the select subcommittee on the coronavirus pandemic is run by the republicans very kindly invited me to travel half way around the world on my own money to be shouted that for four hours. And, and I declined that very kind of offer. They did actually leave a place for me though, just to kind of emphasize that my absence. So today I'm I'm actually almost there. So I've done better than I was to Congress. So I feel vaguely privileged, I guess. Um, so anyway, so seriously, so what I wanna do first part of this talk is show you about how you can use genomics, pretty metagenomics, to understand, explore this thing called the virus sphere, right? And by that, I mean the total universe of, of viruses. And the way I think about this is, is to emphasize the sheer limitation in our understanding of the kind of global universe of viruses. So this is just some very, pretty very small few. These are just two trees. One is of um, the chordates, you can't really read, and this, and this one, sorry, this is the chordates, and this is all of the metazoa of animals and i'm just emphasizing and each of these kind of um uh, columns uh, rows here are different groups of rna viruses and you can just see the taxa that have been sampled for viruses so if you actually look at the the, the metazoa you can see this kind of this this column here is the most filled has the most viruses that's the chordates right because that's us basically and, and and mammals and and birds uh, the next set are the arthropods, but most of this metazoan phylogeny hasn't been sampled. So over here we have placozoa. These are the most basal metazoa. No viruses sampled. Then this is the chordate. So this, is the, this here is this one blown up. This is the chordate. And here, most of the viruses we have in mammals. We have quite a few birds. Quite a few fish are here. We've got about fish today. But again, there are kind of gaps, particularly here, jawless vertebrates, basal vertebrates, basal chordates. 
haven't been sampled. So there are large gaps in our understanding of the virus sphere. So what I do, I won't go into any methods today because it is pretty standard now. The, the way my group tries to understand that, to fill, those, fill in those gaps, is to use metatranscriptomics. So we use shotgun RNA sequencing, where we just take a, take a sample, extract the RNA, deplete the ribosomal RNA normally, then just sequence what's there, and then do use computers to work out what viruses are. So it's a very simple approach. Which I won't discuss again. Um, and the, what I, so then I'm very interested in, in understanding the diversity of the virus. Field. I'm particularly in, interested in understanding viruses that may or may not emerge in humans, so some mammalian viruses. And for that, what I often do is sample at places where humans and wildlife interact. You'll hear a lot about that at the end of my talk, because it's those interaction areas or the fault lines, if you take an earthquake analogy, that's where viruses can jump. So where we interact with wildlife, that's a kind of stress point. That's a danger zone. That's where viruses can, can jump. And I sample a lot of species at those fault lines. So, for example, this is my colleague, Zhang Zheng Zhang, one of the first people to sequence SARS-CoV-2. Here is, he's holding a rodent. It's me and my iPhone at a distance from a town in south, a small city in southeastern China. If you then sample these rodents, what we did, they are full of coronaviruses, it turns out. This is a phylogeny of the coronaviruses, the details, don't worry about it. But you can see some kind of red, some blue, and some green. And each of those is a different genus of coronaviruses. And the ones in blue are beta coronaviruses, SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus. And you can see the kind of diversity there. And the key thing is these are all from rodents in one city in this place called Longquan in China. So under our feet, there's this diversity of viruses in these kind of rodents that live near human houses this little patchwork quilt here is showing you that these these viruses are also jumping between rodent species okay so under our feet this evolution is happening this species jumping is going on and occasionally that's going to get into a human and occasionally very occasionally that might cause an epidemic or even a pandemic so that's kind of what i do so the questions that my research is directed to are how large and diverse is the virus sphere? What determines the evolution of viruses, particularly within ecosystems? As you'll see shortly, when you sample animal species, they don't just have one virus. They have a whole ecosystem of viruses that interact. So what kind of drives that? And how often, how do viruses emerge very occasionally to become disease-causing agents, for example, like in the case of SARS-CoV-2? So I'm going to address those questions today very briefly. So the first thing is how large and how diverse is the virus fit? Now, lots of people are now doing viral sequencing of every environment, every species you can think of that's going ahead. And if you do that, what you end up with are these kind of very large now virus phylogenies. Here's, a, here's one that was a kind of the one that people use now almost to classify RNA viruses. So RNA viruses are classified into five phyla, and there are five more proposed phyla. And the words around the, I can never say these names, around the outside, these are the names of the virus phyla we have. That's the outer ring. And then the inner, inner um, names, they're virus families. So there's this huge kind of big splurge of virus diversity. But the key thing is, you see that, that, that scale bar, that's amino acid changes per site, which is absolutely, these are very, very divergent things, huge distances. So say between, for example, here and here, you picked every site has picked up multiple mutations. They're extraordinarily divergent. And it doesn't take much to realize because of that, the, the sequence alignments used to do these trees and the trees themselves are therefore very, very suspect. So, for example, this tree is based using the, um, the RDRP, the Romulan dependent RNA polymerase, which is the most conserved gene in any RNA virus. And in this particular tree here, the mean pairwise distance of you know, any pair of sequence is about 7.7%. It's often left less than 5% and sometimes less than 1%. And of course, 5% is amino acid sequence. That's the random expectation. So many of these sequences are no more similar than random. Okay. So you might as well go and ask somebody at your local supermarket what the phylogeny is, as do a tree. You know, as to a tree building program, so they're that divergent. And in fact, although this is kind of like the textbook phylogeny, Rob Edgar did some very nice work showing that, in fact, if you change the kind of model of evolution, train the tree building program, change your line method, you can get quite different phylogeny. So this is actually very unstable. OK, but my kind of key question is, is there more? This is the kind of limit we see at the moment. Are there more divergent viruses out there? Is that 
the end of the virus sphere or is there more? And the problem here is um, if you sequence any data set, do metagenomics, any, any sample set, particularly kind of, uh, you know, aquatic environmental samples, you see lots of sequences that match nothing. We call them often orphaned or dark matter. And they could be virus because they kind of often, they're, you know, their context a few thousand amino acids long. They match nothing. Could they be viruses? And so the question is, how then do we kind of find, how can we de determine whether these, these sequences are viruses? And are they more divergent viruses than we detected at the moment? So the way we're going to try and do this, I'm going to quickly go through this bit, is simply using protein structure. And there are a variety of ways you can do that. We've traditionally used a thing called FIRE2. It's a very nice um, structural program. Of course, now we have AlphaFold, which is revolutionizing, it, revolutionizing everything. There's ESM fold, folds the folds. ESM fold, I think, is by Meta. Thankfully, Elon Musk has not got into the protein folding business yet, so they're still working. Fold seeks also very good to just come out. And the, and the notion is this that if you can imagine the kind of the, the, the dotted line around the orange on around the orange circle, that's the limit of the virus sphere that you can see by using sequence similarity, right? Just kind of standard blast light techniques or whatever. You see though, you can detect those viruses, you can do a phylogeny. But the question is, are there, that's my kind of previous tree, are there viruses out here that you can't see because they're too divergent, but they're there? And can you use protein sequences to try and find them? So if, for example, if this is your current um, boundary of detectable virus for using pro primary sequence, maybe protein structure, you can kind of move that out and find more of that hidden virus sphere by looking at structures rather than primary sequences. So other people are trying to do this the way we've just done this. is a colleague here called Mang, my friend Mang Shi from, from China. And we've used um, an AI approach. It's called LucaProt. And the way, what we actually did was use two approaches. One that is based on kind of classic sequence similarity clustering. And one um, using AI where you basically train a model on to recognize the, the RNA polymerase structure. You train it on as many structures as you can. And then you try and use that trained data set to, to interrogate new data, to try and find those structures in divergent sequences. So we did that using published data on the SRA. We've used also generate our own data. And in, in this is the procedure here, if you want to look at it. In that procedure, we discovered 180,000 new viruses, okay, which fell into different clays, different classes. And that's a lot of viruses. Um, we also, we we because we sequenced some ourselves, we made sure they were only in the RNA form, not the DNA form, to be sh really sure they were RNA, RNA, like the RNA virus. We also found, interestingly, there, there at the moment, there are two likely families of, or phyla of, of RNA viruses that are bacteriophage. We, we, we now think we have 10 which, um, with this approach. So it has, it's, it's completely kind of expanded our view of the virus sphere. So graphically, you can look at this. This, the grey, um, these are just these blobs is one of these different viral classes or clays that we found. The grey blobs, they're the ones that are known so far. So they basically correspond to that previous tree. So that kind of grey circle you're seeing there, or that's almost like that detectable virus sphere limit zone there, right? The blue is what we found using a kind of sequence clustering approach. And the orange on the outs, that's the, this is the outer edge of the viral universe. That's what you see using, you detect using this AI approach. So we, we have greatly expanded from kind of like here to here, the diversity of the virus sphere. Okay. And this is now our kind of leading edge. Unfortunately, that's amazing. And if you, you, you can do trees of these different, groups now you sh cannot do a tree of all of them you should not do that and you cannot do that because they're too divergent to align it just would be nonsense so you should do kind of separate trees so these are kind of separate it's like the virus universe kind of put in bite-sized chunks and the key thing is the the, the 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 branches in green they are known and the ones in yellow they are new and you can see the kind of whole clades here of, of pure yellow they are completely unknown viral images that we found using this approach. So we're, we're, we're expanding more, we're discovering more of the virus sphere. So that's a bit esoteric. So I want to focus on one family to kind of make it bring it home a bit. And that family is this one here. It says NIDO, and they're the NIDO, the NIDO viruses. Now, you all know what they are. You may not realize it, but you all know what they are, because they're the ones 
that have made this sit at home for three and a half years because they contain the coronavirus. This is a this is an order called the nidovirus, the nidoviralis, and they contain a number of known um, families. They're the ones in black there, including the coronaviruses up here. So SARS-CoV-2 is that kind of wet Wednesday afternoon, boring little lineage there amongst that diversity. The ones in black and the ones in red are the ones we discovered in this particular approach I just talked about. So you've got five five known family. They're the ones that you've written in there. They're in black, plus this new tax here. Okay, all well and good. Um, that tree is a bit boring to look at. If you then do some sort of decoding, what you find is a few interesting things. We normally think of coronaviruses, particularly as being animal, nearly always mammalian. In fact, if you look at the nidoviruses in general, what you see is I've color coded them here by the environment that they're found in. Some are found in soils, some are found in microbes. M many are found in aquatic environments. And we have therefore we have no idea what the host is. So they're not they're not mammalian, they're not even be animal. They're just a diverse group. Second, the genome structure is much more complicated than we thought before. Traditionally, coronaviruses had one uh, segment, if you like, one bit of RNA. We now see them in multiple segments, two or three segmented, so it's like mini chromosomes you can see for the first time. Second, the, the genome size is much more varied than we thought before. The coronaviruses have traditionally been, nidovirus has traditionally been the longest RNA viruses found. We have one here at 47 KB, which I thought was the longest, but a colleague from Germany has one at 54 KB. So this is the, the biggest RNA viruses you'll see. So again, this approach here, we're expanding the virus sphere, and in particular groups like the nidoviruses, we're kind of expanding their diversity and the diversity of their biologies. Um, I might just actually, I think I'm going to get slumped. I'm just going to skip these slides. Apologies. So there's nothing particularly important in these. So just move on. Um, and I want to focus. So that's the nidovirus. I want to focus on two of the families within the nidoviruses a bit in a bit more detail to bring home again how metagenomics is kind of expanding our understanding of viral diversity and, and, and evolution, macroevolution. And those two families are the coronaviruses and the arteriviruses. So they're both nidoviruses. Okay. Now the coronaviruses. Again, we normally think of them as being mammalian. And here's a tree of the coronaviruses. So there's SARS-CoV-2 there, and there's SARS-CoV-1. And what I've done here, I've taken this tree and I've color coded the kind of backbone by the vertebrate class that they're from. So you see here, these, these two, alpha and beta coronaviruses, they're the ones we're familiar with us. They're in pink because they're mammalian. Then we have a few here that are from birds and from reptiles. And most people don't realize that, in fact, there's now a whole new set down here from kind of wet things. These are often from fish or from sharks. And most of what most interesting of all, um, and this kind of matches the phylogeny here. We've got, we've got mammals, we've got birds and reptiles, and we've got kind of fish down here. Most interesting of all, this one's here, it says Kana Kana. They are from the New Zealand lamprey. And a lamprey is a jawless vertebrate, so that's down here. And it doesn't quite match the host phylogeny, but to me, this kind of suggests that this this family the coronaviridae are as old as the vertebrates i'll suggest so 500 million years or so so that's the coronaviruses now the arteriovirus i'm sure you've never heard of they're also nidoviruses but they're actually very important and they're, they're they're responsible for a few diseases i live in australia and we 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 have a, one of our iconic domestic animals is the possum this is a, this is a brush tail possum and they suffer from a disease caused by a nidovirus and that disease is the fabulously named wobbly possum disease it sounds kind of amusing but in fact it's actually really pretty gruesome so i'm going to show a quick video of this so this is a wobbly possum and that's a you can see that's an en encephalitis it's it's basically fatal and that's caused by a, by a nidovirus if you take the sequence, so we sequence this virus, and you take that, that virus sequence and put it in a tree of, of, the, of, the, of the arteri viruses, these nidoviruses, what's very striking is the phylogeny of these viruses very strongly matches the phylogeny of the host. So here, these are from the placental mammals. There's our possum one, which is the sister group to the placental mammals, as it should be, as it's from the marsupial. These are from reptiles and amphibians, and these are from fish. That very strongly matches the host phylogeny. So that tells us that these two families, the coronavirus and arteriviruses, are probably 500, over 500 million years old. So these are ancient, ancient viruses, right? So the viruses are very diverse, and ergo, they are ancient. You can see that here. And that pattern of ancient, ancient history is now becoming true 
becoming clear for lots and lots of RNA viruses we thought were kind of mammalian only. In fact, they are ancient, older things than that. So here's another example. These are very bad tree. These are called the Articula virales. I hate these names, which you would never have heard of. But in fact, they contain, you can just read that there, they contain the ortho mix of viruses or the flu viruses. So traditionally, we thought flu was a, a, an avian virus that may get into a pig and into a human. That's still true. But in fact, flu-like viruses, where you, where, where you say it's flu, not flu, it's kind of arbitrary. Flu-like viruses are found, he can be the names here, in, in eels, in toads, in hagfish. That's a jaw. In fact, some other fish here as well. So these are actually ancient things. And their ancestors, their relatives, are also tend to be fish or invertebrates. Now, my... I have a post on Mary Patron, and she's very interested in, in, in um, divergent viruses. And she's been sam sampling animals, invertebrates, of the phyla nadiria. And the nadiria, you may well, you may probably never heard of, but they're in invertebrate phyla that contain things like um, jellyfish and coral. And in doing that, she's discovered some of these articular virales in these, in these basal um, invertebrates. So that tells us that maybe these flu-like viruses are as old as this particular split in the, in the history of Edozoa. So that's probably 600 million years or so. The same is also true of the flavy viruses. These are iconic disease-causing viruses like dengue and Zika and um, uh, yeah, yellow fever, classic human disease-causing viruses. We normally thought they were mammalian, metagenomics for finding them in more and more diverse things and they actually are also in nadiria in in um in things like coral and sea stars and in fact they we can actually we got we have some here and that tells us we think probably these flavy viruses are 700 to 800 million years old so again very very ancient things and that's true of many rna virus families okay so viruses are ancient and diverse if you then also, if you sample an ecosystem or a wildlife species, you, it's, they don't just carry one virus, they carry an enormous number of different viruses. So I'm just gonna give you an example. I'm just gonna skip this slide here. Um, I'm gonna give you, um, so yeah, so these, these wildlife carry an, an awfully large number of viruses. And a, a key point I wanna make here is the fact that when we think about um, disease emergence, we have a tendency to put humans at the end of the chain. So the, we always think about there's the, there's the reservoir and then it gets into a human. In fact, what we actually now see is that humans, this very complex virus ecology, humans are not at the end, they're in the middle. I.e. humans can pass their viruses to other species too. We're not separate from ecology, we're kind of part of ecology, okay? And so a good, a really good, an amazing example of that is SARS-CoV-2. I've been doing virus work for 30 plus years, 35 years. I've never seen a virus that can infect as many different species as SARS-CoV-2. It's incredible. This is a very nice website from people in Vienna to show you a map of the world and some of the animals that have been infected with human SARS-CoV-2, i.e. from humans. So you have here mink, mink cats, dogs, tigers, uh, lions, armadillo, gorilla, Deer, you're in the US over there, white-tailed deer, very high prevalence. So humans are passing their virus to, to other animals. And that's true of other viruses too. So there's this comp very complicated system, global ecosystem going on with things being passed around. It's not a simple chain with humans at the end. <clears throat> now, can, can I give you a very quick, I mean, very quick example of this ecology's complex ecosystem? And that's going to be on fish. So I've done a lot of work on fish viruses. Easy as a sample. Australia has a lot of fish and my group get to go and sample them in kind of cool places. So this is Northern Australia <clears throat> and that kind of weird looking like skeleton kind of thing. That's the Great Barrier Reef, which is one of the amazing things. It's about 1500 miles long, supports 1200 fish species. So what we, what we have done is go to this reef and we have sampled um, two island <clears throat> ecosystems, Orpheus Island, it's a hard life, someone's got to do it. Orpheus Island and Lizard Island on the Great Barrier Reef. So basically we take a reef about 150 meters square and we sample all the fish species in that, in those particular reef systems. It's like the cast of Finding Nemo, right? You have all these animals you sample. Now we do that and these viruses, these fish are absolutely full of virus. I mean, huge numbers of viruses, completely unlike humans or most mammal systems you find, fish carry a ton. Now I'm not gonna describe any details, kind of a bit, a bit dense for this and I wanna to get to other stuff, but basically these fish carry a lot of viruses. Um, 
even in very, very small eco, you know, spatial areas of 100 meters square, as you find lots of viruses. Interesting, though, is the key thing to remember, although there's lots of viruses, they're not really jumping between the different fish species. These fish species are actually quite divergent. They're from different orders, different families, uh, different genera. And so they're quite divergent, and the viruses just don't move between. So lots of viruses there, but they're not really jumping um, between them very, very often. Um, we also, again, we looked at two islands. I won't discuss this in any detail. I'm going to move on, but they kind of have broadly similar kind of fish virus. Okay, so lots of viruses in these fish, even though these fish are very small and live a very short time often, they're carrying lots of viruses, but they're not really, the viruses are not really jumping between the fish very, fish very often. So hold that thought. This is a marine system. Now I'm going to focus on a, on a freshwater system, which is one of the classic stories of in evolution, and that's the chiclid fish of Lake Tanganyika. So this is this these these kind of rift um, valley lakes, these finger lakes in Africa, very big, and in these in these freshwater systems, there's been a radiation of fish over 10 million years. So in Lake Tanganyika, the fish entered about 10 million years ago, the ancestral fish, and it's diversified into four, 240 species of, the, of these sick fish. They're very dramatically in kind of body size and habitat and more, you know, morphology coloring. And there are different tribes. This is the tribes here. These are kind of examples of the fish. So it's amazing adaptive radiation, the classics in evolutionary biology. So this is Easter. I'm down here. I'm down here exactly at the moment in Stellenbosch. Uh, this is East Africa and there's Lake Tanganyika full of these chiclid fish. So lots of fish and these fish contain lots of viruses. I won't discuss it in any detail, but we've just we've here are the viruses we found. We sample these fish. They're full of virus. OK, right. Just like the, 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 the fish in the Great Barrier Reef. But in contrast, what's so interesting Lots of viruses, but in contrast to the barrier reef system, in this freshwater system, the viruses are jumping between the fish all the time. So there's no species, there's no barrier to transmission to emergence. It's a continual kind of super viruses moving between them. Why the difference? Probably because these viruses, these fish are very closely related. They only diver diversified over the last 10 million years. So there's been more opportunity. So because they're closely related, there's there's less time for evolution to evolve barriers to stop viruses. Trans, you know, transmitting. So closely, the more closely you are, the less barriers, genetic barriers are to cross-species transmission disease emergence. So that's why the, the this close related reef, uh, lake system, Lake Tanganyika, differs from this kind of um, the reef system where fish are more divergent from different kind of families and things. Very interesting bit of evolution ecology. Okay, so given all that kind of general stuff, and I want to focus on SARS-CoV-2 because. You know, it has it, it. It kind of does actually relate to what I've just told you. It's, it is about virus discovery. It is about risk. It is about disease emergence. But it's also made me kind of really angry. So I apologise if I kind of lose my temper because it has been a bit of a bit of a and it's on a daily, daily ongoing thing. But I want to kind of update you. So it has been a ride. Okay. So if you go, um, if you go online, you can find endless, endless stuff online. Um, Here's some sort of interesting flow diagram. I guess I'm here. I'm the science with a skull and crossbow. I guess that's me somewhere. Um, other people have posted these kind of like, is this my papers? with everyone kind of linked together in some sort of great wall of crazy conspiracy. Um, even more precisely, oh, here we go. I was accused of um, being involved with the People's Liberation Army in China for faking the sequence of a virus from a pangolin. This is kind of someone saying I've been busted. So here are the, here are the scientists from China who supposedly faked the pangolin sequencing. Very careful, very cleverly standing in uniform in front of their poster showing it, okay, which is obviously highly successful subversive operation. That was covered by Australian press. This is me, um, supposedly working PLA. You get things like this, uh, you see online, these are the Communist Party so I'm quite proud to be on this actually. It's Communist Party scientists, me, it's Lin Fa Wang and Malik Paris. There's there's Tony Fauci, of course. Um extraordinary stuff. Here's here's one where I'm being compared to a, a, a cartoon character from a well-known uh British comedy. This is not a compliment, by the way. But my favorite one was actually just recently where I was accused of being someone said I looked, I was like Oppenheimer without the security clearance or the sense of regret which was uh, a good a good gag a good gag but i don't think that's quite true anyway so it's been a it's been a, an amazing kind of extraordinary event 
So what actually is true? Okay, so what we do know clearly is that the, the SARS-CoV-2, its closest related viruses are found in bats. It's not any old bat, it's in these rhinolophus or these horse horseshoe bats. So you can work this out, rhino, nose, I guess lophus means kind of flat or something. This is a horseshoe bat, you can see the kind of horseshoe structure. And these bats are pretty common reservoirs for SARS-like coronaviruses. And some of them carry SARS-2 like coronaviruses. And the closest we have so far, or oh, I'm sure more will come, are from Laos. And it's the, and the closest one is called Banal 2052. It is in no means banal. It's actually a very cool virus. Banal actually means bat anal. Okay. And this virus is about 96.8% similar to SARS-CoV-2. So you've got SARS-CoV-2. But now 2052, and they're about 3.2% divergence. Now, it's hard to work out exactly how different that is in evolution. There's lots of recombination, but we're talking between, you know, five and 10 years, depending on which gene sequence you look at. So there's a bit of a gap. So SARS-CoV-2, closest bat viruses, there's a gap of a few years, right? Now, interestingly, so they're very, they're very similar across the whole genome. They're particularly similar in the receptor binding domain, which is the kind of functional core of the virus. It's the bit of the virus that kind of opens the cellular lock. And in that bit of sequence there, these, these rhinolophus bat, bat viruses are very close, almost identical. So this is that, just that tree here is showing. So in nature, there are viruses like, and they, they can bind very well human ACE2 receptor and human cells. So there are viruses in nature like this that are locked and loaded, ready to infect human cells. And these rhinolophus bats are very, very common across parts of East Asia. This is just some heat. The darker the colour, the more bats there are. You can see the kind of heavy concentration down here, the generous in places, in general places, places like southern China, you've got Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Thailand there. Okay. So that's the closest one. Um, but it's actually a slightly more nuanced pitch than that. My man, my she, my colleague, just recently he did some work sampling in Yunnan. This is Yunnan province here in China, and in Yunnan province, we Yunnan's a great place to sample. It's very there's a very strong bias towards sampling Yunnan. By the way, it's now it's a very good place for bat habitats. There are other places have bats in China, but Yunnan is what's traditionally a really good sampling spot. Lots of kind of caves for them. So we sampled in Yunnan. Province here, this is Yunnan province, in different areas in Yunnan. And we picked up a very interesting virus that is um, a recombinant between a SARS 1 like bat virus and a SARS 2 like bat virus, a kind of hybrid. So, in some parts of the genome, it's like SARS 1, in other parts of the genome, it's like SARS 2. Interestingly, in the receptor binding domain, um, there's there, the blue is the human ones. There is, this is this is the one for Yunnan, and there is the ones, there the live ones. It's actually closer to SARS-CoV-2 than the, the ones from the lab. So this is the closest one we have yet to humans in uh, the human virus in, in an animal. It's from Yunnan. So, and it's recombinant. So there are, there, there's still a massive amount of a hidden diversity yet to be found in, the, in these viruses. So how then do we get back the, to the next question? And this is the key one. How do we get from bats to the first place the virus is detected in any great number? And then great numbers, and that's the Huan market in, in Wuhan. Now, the key to this, and I'm absolutely sure this market is the key, is for, there's another piece of evidence for that. First of all, Mike Warby, my colleague, um, and some other colleagues did some work last year. We took the earliest cases of SARS-CoV-2 from December 2019, and we plotted them on a map of Wuhan. That's what you're seeing here, okay? And the key thing was um, you then do statistical analysis and say, what, what are these points from 20, December 2019? What are they kind of centred around? And what you see is the... Um, the the, the the kind of the 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 epicenter of that distribution is this Hawaiian and seafood our wild animal market and that's right there and the really cool thing was some of these patients worked at the market or lived there so you might expect them to be centered around the market but lots of other people here had no link to the market they were didn't work they didn't live there they hadn't visited there but they were also their distribution also centered around the market and that makes means the market is the epicenter now many people have said oh it's just because they sampled the market preferentially or the market was in the the case description it's just not true that we check very carefully that's in bias that really isn't true and this market is simply not a particularly busy place you can't really see these kind of points here this is kind of visitor numbers for different markets and different kind of 
places in Wuhan. I went to the market. I've been to the market in 2024. It's kind of like a wet Wednesday afternoon. There wasn't many people there at all. And it's not a very busy market. If you actually look at this kind of plot here, this is market visitor uh, attendances. It's down here. There are many more, right? So it's not particularly, it's not this it's crowded or it's sampling bias. It just happens to be the place. And it's the place because it was the place that was selling wildlife okay i was there in 2014 and i took some now quite famous photographs of some wildlife That's, this is my photograph of raccoon god if i'd have known it'd been important photograph i would have done it better than i did so this is a raccoon dog this is a kind of an entrance to the market these are from 2019 we've got marmots here porcupines that's uh, more raccoon dogs then the key thing is in in early 2020 they said they closed the market in january um january 2020, January 1st, 2020, they went in later on and they swabbed surfaces, you know, cages, gowns, bench tops, um, feather removing machines, and then tested later on to see where the virus was. And the virus, the market's in two halves, west half and the east side, about the size of a soccer field each. The key thing was when they then tested the results and they put them on the map of the market, the southwestern corner had the most PCR positive cases. And that was where the wildlife was. They also then did metagenomic sequencing on this. You may have heard this story. We're writing another paper on this at the moment. And that metagenomic sequencing, we looked at it. It shows lots of over there. I hope you can read from where you are. Some of the animals have got hedgehogs, army hedgehogs, we've got monk jacks, raccoon dogs, marmots, bamboo rats, porcupines, hedgehogs. And it's like a, it's a zoo, right? There's an enormous number of animals that are there. And it's in that southwestern corner. In fact, bizarrely, I took a photograph of there's one stall there that's the most positive stall of all. And that's the one I took a photograph of in, in, in 2014. And it, to me, this looks just like SARS-1. SARS-1 emerged in a in a in a in a in a market in Guangdong um, in 20 in 2002 involving raccoon dogs and civets. And we have a market here in Hubei province, and there are civets and raccoon dogs and other species there as well. So I think this is the epicenter. I'll come back to this in a second. Now, uh, many people have said, does it come from the lab? This has been a huge one. I haven't got time to discuss this in any detail. Here's my list of kind of formal objections. And the argument, and basically there's absolutely, I hate to tell you, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever, zero, it comes in the lab. The key thing, of course, if, you know, you'd expect, you, you, if they if it came from the lab, you'd expect that virus or very close rate relative of that virus to be in that lab. And there's simply no evidence for it. We've got three and a half years of intelligent investigation of it. They've found absolutely nothing. Right. So nothing at all. There's been endless talk of cover ups. I'm just going to give you a quick email here. So the, the, one of the great conspiracies is, is that told is, is I'm sure you've heard is that um, we all thought of the lab escape. Then this this uber Svengali figure called Tony Fauci persuaded us to change our mind, and it wasn't and to, because he funded that lab, and it wasn't you know he wanted to protect himself. Absolute, I'm going to swear nonsense. Here's a key email. This is an email uh, from Tony Fauci. This has actually been four years. This is why I'm allowed to share it from Tony Fauci, Jeremy Farrer, on the day of the teleconference, and um, you can read it yourself. Basically, I'll, I'll leave it for a second. And it's essentially the complete opposite. It basically says, go and investigate and do your best. There's no, I mean, there's, there's, I mean the idea that we were persuaded, not, I mean, it's just, I'm not going to go on, it's complete nonsense. So I really do think this is a natural outbreak. I really do think it's the center of the market. And the reason why I think it's going to finish here, the reason why I think this is that these markets and the trade that they represent the game, the game food trade and the fur farm trade is a tangible risk. This is where we get pandemics. So even though now in China the animal markets are closed, um, you, the, 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 the farms that supply the markets for game food, okay, or, or fur are still open. So in, we went with some colleagues in China. We these are the famous menu boards you see at the of live animals at these markets. We went, we went and sampled some of these species okay from these wildlife breeding farms that use the fur trade or game trade so we sample things like civets and, and um hedgehogs porcupines a raccoon dog that's a badger marmot um blue rat. and in doing that we sampled 2000 animals or so we found a whole bunch of viruses that we think are of risk to humans because they can jump 
species boundaries, including things like um, HKU8 coronavirus in a civet and H9N2 avian flu virus in a civet and a badger. In fact, um, H9N2 avian flu virus was in the Hawana market metagenomic sample. So they had avian flu in that market as well. Just kind of put us in context of how dangerous these things are. This is a, show a few quick videos. This is an Asian badger. This is actually one of the animals we sampled. If you look, you see that no, see that that this animal has influenza, avian flu, H9 into avian flu. This is now a raccoon dog. I'm sure I'm just, I wonder if the sound's gonna play. You can hear that. So that's a raccoon dog with a cough, right? So be very afraid. This is where you get pandemics. And the last one, this is a raccoon dog. This is a very nasty thing. This is um, one gastric infection. So it's a severe kind of enteric disease. Uh, sorry to show you this. Is it lunchtime in California? Um, I apologize for this. Anyway, but, you know, people are, it's a horrible thing. People are holding it with their hands. This is just, this is the risk. This is the risk. This is the human animal interface that will cause pandemics. And it turns out that in, in China and other countries, this, this fur farming trade is absolutely enormous, right? Absolutely enormous. And that's what's going to lead to a pandemic. And we're seeing it now, some of you may well know, with avian flu, H5N1 avian flu has changed its ecology. It is now infecting more and more bird species all across particularly in the americas but during that time it's also got into mammals here's an outbreak in south america in seals and here's one from finland um just a few months ago and h5 one here has got into these farmed fur farmed animals in finland you can read a list foxes mink and raccoon dogs okay so it's exactly the same thing i think likely cause cause covid 19 so this fur farm, the what farms, these 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 fur farms, they're a menace, and they will cause more pandemics. So watch this space. So I hope you found that interesting. Um, obviously, I'm just the kind of cheerleader. I haven't got time to mention all the people that did all the real work. I just kind of like just saying it for you. Lots of man hours went, person hours went into this. Um, I'll stop there. Hopefully, um, have time for a question or two. Thank you. Don't be shy, I can take it. Yeah, I, I can start it off though, uh, because I have something for you, um, kind of connecting the two parts of your talk. So we have all these new viruses and this new diversity you discover on one side. And on the other side, we have these emerging viruses and people claiming that soon we'll be able to predict which is the next big emerging virus. Um, and so on one side, it feels almost impossible because everything is so new so how can we predict yeah. anything on the other side when you look at the pandemic it's like influenza it's it's sars cov2 it's um, ebola it's not like this new virus it's like somewhat known ish yeah so do you think we have sampled and studied enough anything around the human so that we can actually do this prediction of emerging viruses I, without having to without too much yeah. of the very new stuff I, I don't think we can predict very well. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure should we, we should even try. So, yeah, look, it's very, it's very simple to say it's going to be the big, the pandemic will be a respiratory virus, okay? Because respiratory is the hardest to control. So they spread the fastest. It, will be, it won't be a vector-borne virus. It won't be Ebola. It'll be a respiratory virus. And there, there are only three virus categories in humans that really fit that bill. That's coronaviruses, influenza viruses, paramyxa viruses. So that narrows it down, right? But that's kind of trivial. The next point is, though, which of those and where will it be? And that's much, much harder. And I, I'm not sure that we, I'm not confident we've got will ever be able to do that with absolute precision. That kind of makes me a little bit nervous. What, so what I think we ought to do is do much better surveillance at the human animal interface, right? Things like these wildlife farms and these fur farms and abattoirs, or I live right next to the bat roost in city. Those, those people are at the front line, they're gonna get exposed, right? So that, that's where we need to focus our, our surveillance. To me, that's the biggest thing we can do. But I don't, I'm just gonna go one, one, say one more thing. The, the biggest problem now we have is, I think in terms of science, we, we've made amazing, strides forward in understanding how viruses transmit between species in using metagenomics 
in mRNA vaccines. That we've got all those things in place to stop to, to pre predict, prevent, right? The problem is now the politics is so bad. It's so bad that I actually think we're in a worse position than we were in 2020. And I think now the situation is that people are scared to say anything. They're scared. They're scared because they, if they, if they say something, they may get blamed or, or criticised. So it's better to say nothing than to put your hand up and say you've got a problem. This is this is the problem now. Not the science, the politics. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Any other question before we move to lunch? After? Okay. Let me go up the stairs. Fantastic work. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, most of the work you've covered is on RNA viruses. Is that correct? Uh, and if yeah. so, are there fundamental differences in transmission, evolution, all these aspects, if you think about DNA viruses? Um. <clears throat> The, yeah, so um, so the big differences are RNA viruses just do everything on fast forward because the, the error rate is error rate is so much higher. So the error rate is probably um, yeah, hundred, yeah, hundreds of thousands of times faster. So the the mechanisms are, are basically the same. They jump species boundaries. They they do all that. They recombine. They just don't do it as rapidly. So they adapt a, a bit slowly. They tend to cause epidemics as rapidly. So it's the same kind of, it's the same procedure, but on, on slow-mo on average. Mm 